Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, W0QE. And this video is a continuation of the previous video showing three methods for measuring impedance with the VNA. The previous video should be watched before this one and a link is provided below. So why try to measure 10 kilo ohms at 100 megahertz and not some other impedance at a different frequency? Well, there's no real reason other than the fact that I often want to measure common mode choke impedances of up to about five kilo ohms at frequencies through six meters or 54 megahertz. So the 10 kilo ohms at 100 megahertz seemed like a nice goal. The topic of trying to measure high impedances comes up regularly, and I've visited this topic twice in the past. Again, those links will be provided below also. Hope you find this video to be useful. Before we begin making measurements, we need to come to terms with a few items so that the measurements we make are meaningful. The first one is we're gonna need a high impedance standard. And that standard would be nice if it could be 10K plus J0. If it's not, it at least needs to be known. We need to look at that. Second thing is, if we're going to need a test fixture of some sort to hold this standard, the test fixture itself either needs to contribute nothing to the high impedance standard that we have or a predictable amount that we can compensate for. Thirdly, we make the measurement with the VNA. And finally, we make measurements uh, temperature and voltage dependencies because we're trying to measure something that's pretty hard to measure. And that's a reflection coefficient of 0.99. If we do the calculation here, a 10k ohm resistor is a 200 to 1 SWR, so the reflection coefficient is 199 over 201, which is 0.999. Shown here are some little test fixtures that I've used. This one for 0603, resistor just barely fits in there. 0805, resistor size, that barely fits in there. 1206 for this one. And I calibrate these by um, doing open short load, say, on one side where I have an open. A short is just a 0 ohm resistor here. A load is a 49.9 ohm resistor. That's good enough for this purpose. And then when I do the through calibration, I put a 0 ohm resistor here. And that works quite well. And I've done that in a couple, couple times in the past. And links to those uh, measurements are below the video. But nevertheless, if we're going to use a surface mount resistor, the thing we need to be very, very careful about is the shunt capacitance. If I take a service mount component and I put it on a printed circuit board, we end up with a lot more capacitance. If the, if the component by itself is 0.05 to 0.06 picofarads, which is typical of like 0805 or 1206 resistors, and we put a pad here where we solder down the, the component, a pad here, we've now changed the spacing on the capacitor quite a bit from what the part itself has. Plus the FR4 circuit board, has a dielectric constant of four or five. And with that being the case, uh, we're better off just using the, the resistor by itself with nothing else attached to it, provided we can do that. If we do a Google search for frequency responsive surface mount resistors, we will come up with several things, but the one that's most important is this first one. And if we look at that file, we get a very good paper about service mount components from Vache, who's a reputable manufacturer. And while they did these up to 40 gigahertz, they made measurements, and the parts were tiny little parts, 0201, 0402, etc. There's a lot we can learn from this uh, paper. First thing we can learn from it is an 0603 resistor has a native internal capacitance of 0 0.04 picofarads. If we want to use a larger part than that, our part will have a, lar a wider spacing because it's a larger part, but also have a larger area. The capacitance doesn't rise too much. I've measured 1206 resistors to point, have 0 0.05 picofarads of parallel capacitance. The next thing we can see is the equivalent circuit for the part. It's a resistor, and this resistance has inductance in it, which is the length of the, of the resistance piece of the, of the component. And the capacitance is primarily from the end cap to end cap, and these inductors represent external and, and capacitors represent external uh, lead inductance if you have any external leads. And we're going to try to make those, those be zero. The other thing that's kind of interesting is if we go down a little further, we see graphs like this where we see a 100 ohm resistor having the best, free, best response in terms of the ratio of impedance versus resistance. You would hope that that would be a value of one. And these show components less than 100 ohms being typically inductive as you go up in frequency, and these show components higher than 100 ohms being capacitive as we go up in frequency. Again, 100 megahertz is way down here, and all these parts are looking pretty good. Uh, we can also see a couple other things real quickly. One of them is 
This is how surface mount resistors are typically trimmed for value. All of these affect very slightly the inductance in the part. They really don't affect the capacitance. The capacitance is due to this end cap to this end cap, and that's pretty much all there is to it. In the past, I've twice made these measurements on components like 1206 resistors with a fixture just like this, but instead of measuring the resistance uh, as an S11 measurement to ground here, I've measured it as a through resistance, so it would be the S21 through measurement that I talked about in the previous video. Doing that results in a graph like this. This graph was done by um, a guy I know in France, but he did it very, very carefully. And he did it for a lot of component, a lot of different component values. They were, they were all 1206 resistors. And what we see is every one of these resistors ends up asymptotically going along this line. This line is equivalent to 50 femtofarads or 0 0.05 picofarads. And you can do that measurement yourself, and it's actually kind of fun to do. And it doesn't take very high-priced VNA to do. It can be done with pretty simple VNAs, provided you've taken care in calibrating them. Now if we use SimSmith to look at the equivalent circuit for the surface mount component, what we see is, here's the equivalent circuit that Vachet said for the surface mount component, resistance in series with an inductance, and a parallel capacitance across the component. We're going to make a measurement of the impedance right here. So we're doing like an S11 measurement. And the resistor value is 10K. The capacitance is 50 femtofarads. And it might be something, it might be something different, but 50 is approximately the right value. And I use 600 picohenries for the inductance. And we'll see in a minute that that really doesn't matter at all. But what I see at 100 megahertz is a, re is a resistor which no longer is resistive, but has a reactive piece that's pretty large. But we'll, let's look and see if that's really important or not. So at low frequencies, we see there's three plots here. G.Zn.M, which is the impedance right here, looking this direction into this component. And since it's shorted on this side, um, it's just the value of the component itself. And we plotted both the magnitude of the impedance, the real part of the impedance, and the reactive part of the impedance. And I put the real part and the magnitude on this side, and I put the reactive piece on this side. So at, ten, at one, megahertz, 1 megahertz or something down here low, we see that this is virtually 10K plus J0. However, by the time we get to 100 megahertz, what we see is the magnitude of the impedance being 9.54K, with the resistive piece being 9.10K, and the reactive piece being minus 2.86K. And you might say, well, that's pretty bad. That's a pretty bad resistor at 100 megahertz. But let's look at that a little more closely. If we plot it on a Smith chart, and go over here and zoom in. Now, remember, I'm scanning from 1 to 1 megahertz to 1,000 megahertz. Let's go just to 100 megahertz. What we see is this. So at 1 megahertz, we see, zoom in even further. At 1 megahertz, we see a magnitude of 9.99K minus J30, which you'd say that's whatever. It, it looks pretty darn close to, to just 10K plus J0. And up here, we see impedance of 9.09K minus J2.86K. And that's, that's the value we get. But looking at it on, on, a, on a big scale, It looks pretty darn close to a dot. When we, when we finally zoom out to where we can see enough of the Smith chart, there's the center of the Smith chart. It looks pretty much like a dot. And if we look at it even really closely, what we see is this represents a reflection coefficient of 0 0.990 at 0 degrees. And this represents a reflection coefficient of 0 0.990 at minus 0.18 degrees. That's one, less than one-fifth of a degree. And I'm going to use, say that's pretty darn good, but can we actually put this in a circuit and get that, get that from it, or are we going to end up with something worse? If we do something, let's just say, foolish, and we have an extra, look what happens if this is just one picofarad. Look how bad that looks. Now down here, at one peak, with one picofarad, at 100 megahertz, it now looks like 249 ohms minus J1.55K.
And here's a file similar to the previous one, except now I have two surface mod components that are both controlled from one place. But I also have, but one of them has lead inductance. And again, I'm going to plot the magnitude, the real part, and the reactive part of the impedance. And I'll do it for both looking at this point and looking at this point in the circuit. And I do that with this plot command right here, which is similar to what I did before. Now, if I go ahead and I increase this lead inductance to be, say, like 50 nanohenries, which is huge, what I see is some small changes at high frequencies, but at 100 megahertz, there's almost virtually no change at all, which is kind of interesting. And the other thing is that this inductance really doesn't matter at all. If I set this inductance to be large, small, you don't see any change in the, in the plots at all. So the internal inductance of the part has nothing to do with the overall result of the impedance of the, of the, of the component. The parallel capacitance has a huge amount to do with it, and small amount of lead inductance has no, no effect at all. Now, if you really wanted to, you could increase this inductance a lot, and eventually you could get a, a component that looked pretty good like almost like 10K plus J0 at 100 megahertz. If, we no, if you notice the black curve, you'll see that the reactive piece of this component goes from zero, maybe down here to minus 100 ohms, and up here to say 13 ohms at, uh, at 100 megahertz. This is very good, but can you come up with 4.57 microhenries without having some parallel capacitance in here? It's gonna get in the way and if I did suggest this to somebody, everybody would have to make their own inductor and that kind of stuff. And the net effect would be instead of, let's just do this from to 100 megahertz. The net effect would be instead of the, the red curve, it's this green curve. And, you know, I, it's hard for me to really say one's better than the other one. And this is certainly harder to do. So I wouldn't suggest that we do that. And now let me show off a little bit with Sim Smith. Sim Smith can do a lot of really cool calculations and it's very powerful. What I'm going to do initially is not sw only sweep the frequency. I'm going to sweep from 1 megahertz to 6.31 gigahertz in a logarithmic fashion. So I have a really wide range of frequencies across the x axis here. And what we see for a 10K surface mount resistor with the parameters we just included before, 50 femtofarads in parallel, a small inductance in series with it, we see this curve. And now we're, what we're measuring is a 50 ohm generator for both of these generators and a 50 ohm load for both of these. And But we're looking at this circuit only. So L dot P, right, right here, L dot P represents what you would measure in an S21 through measurement because we've got this component in series here, not in shunt, S21 series measurement. What we'd see is a value of about minus 40.1 dB throughout most of the HF range, or throughout most of the HF range, and by the time we get up here to 100 megahertz, we would see the value drop increasing to minus 39.7, actually minus 39.678 dB is the value at 100 megahertz. And you can see that if you change this, this inductance value all over the place, nothing really changes at all. The internal inductance has very little to do with this circuit. The shunt capacitance has a lot to do with it. We can, as we change the shunt capacitance, we see a lot of, lot of effect. Now let's do something kind of fun. Instead of plotting L dot P here, I'm going to plot, plot it myself here. And I have some labels attached to it. And I'm now going to sweep also, the resistor values. I'm going to sweep them two per decade. So we go 1, 31.6, 100, 316, 1,000, 3160, 10,000, etc., etc., all the way up to 1 mega ohm. And these curves are all plotted, and we see the asymptotic value here. Now, over here, we're going to plot the result of a series capacitor in a series through circuit. Again, 
50 ohm generator, 50 ohm load, a series through circuit. And that's LG1.P. And look at it. There's the, there's the 50 femtofarad value, which matches exactly what our circuit is. Now, if you made these measurements yourself with some number of values in here, not not necessarily this many, but just some number, and you saw this asymptotic value, you could mess with what the value was. You could change it and see which matched what what best matched your measurements. When I did this the first time, 55 femtofarads matched my measurements. And as I got a little bit more careful, I got it down to 50. Uh, but if you saw something that matched, the, your, your curves were, were, were rolling off at this point. I mean, this is, this is pretty cool. SimSmith can simulate this stuff very, very nicely. But the bottom line is, the capacitance rules the world in terms of getting this measurement to be something that uh, is close to 10K at 100 megahertz. Continuing on, I decided to try to make some S11 measurements of this 10K resistor. And what I had was my open, short, and load and an SMA female connector and a 10K load. This 10K load is soldered from center pin straight across to here. And what you see as you go across this point, you see that this is going to increase the capacitance of this measurement because part of the resistor is going to be, has ground nearby. And we expect this to be not as good a measurement. Then I machined a little trough in here and I moved the resistor from here over to here, made the measurement again. And those represent two measurements. The third measurement I made was done this way. On the end of an end male connector, I put two wires that are basically an inch, inch high. I didn't move them. They started off whatever width they were here, and they ended up being exactly at the width of a 1206 resistor. I did my open short load calibrations. Short and load were right here. This shows a zero ohm load here. And the open was right here. And then I did my 10K load right here as a measurement after I calibrated it. The idea being that whatever this transmission line or whatever these leads represented, they would be compensated out in the calibration process. And that's my third measurement. And here's the results. The first plot that's shown here is not a measurement, but is a plot of the impedance measured right here using SimSmith as a VNA. And that's just the circuit we had before. Again, I just replotted that. I've, replot I've changed the scales here somewhat, but I've just replotted it. And I've gone from one to 150 megahertz with the circles being at 100 megahertz. And this is again what we had in initially, which was 9.54K of magnitude of impedance, a 9.1 minus J2.85K impedance that gave you this as the magnitude. And the first thing I have plotted here is the, the file is, was, was captured from my uh, 4170 and I saved it and brought it into SimSmith and it is the no gap file. It was the one where the SMA connector, the resistor was soldered across where the, where the uh, ground was close to the resistor. And that's going to be the, that will be LG1. So let's look at those three curves. And they look pretty bad compared to what the ideal is. SimSmith, this, this one here, these three with the dotted lines, or dashed lines, represent the SimSmith calculation, and these represent keeping green with green and blue with blue and red with red. These represent what the actual measurement was. They look pretty, pretty bad. And what you see from that is a, a lot more capacitance. The, the, the um, component becomes capacitive much more quickly. Let's look at LG2. LG2 represents the, with the 15 mil gap that I machined into the connector. When I did that, I got those three. Now, the overall magnitude of the impedance is pretty close. Whoops, I screwed that one up. There we go. Now what I have is the overall magnitude of the impedance is better than the previous one. The real part of the impedance, the green one, is better than the previous one was. And the reactive piece is more closely what we expect it to be also. But we still see we still see extra capacitance in this circuit. Then when I go to the one with the one inch leads, 
Let me get rid of all these other ones now. Or not all of them, but just... Um, those. Now we have the, the lighter lines being what the estimate would be based on SimSmith acting as a VNA, and the dark lines being what I actually measured. They are pretty darn close. So my little antenna analyzer can do a pretty good job at 100 megahertz with a 10K load, provided I make sure that I don't get any additional capacitance in the circuit that's un unaccounted for. Even though this was the third time for me making these types of measurements, every time I do so, I learned a little bit more about how to make measurements accurately, and I hope you've enjoyed the video. If anyone makes these measurements, let me know your results, please. If you have any comments or questions, also please let me know. And if you have any ideas for future videos, feel free to leave those um, in the comments section or contact me directly. Hope you've enjoyed the video.